Good. Okay. Eric, to everybody, that was just the, 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 the pregame show, a few uh, moments discussion on Hanukkah. I uh, want to welcome everybody. Wish everybody Hanukkah Sameach. We have a very special dedication of today's shir. And uh, today's shir is being dedicated in honor of the birthday of Dr. Moshe Sokolo by his family. And uh, we want to wish you a happy birthday. Yes, I know it was meant to be a surprise. That's why I did not go out on the email. But your family and yeah. all of us wish you a happy birthday. I may have asked Thank you, me, I guess, at least. I won't ask you how many, uh, what number we're at, but I uh, want to wish you and your wife, who's, of course, with us, who uh, initiated all this. Uh, maybe I'm not supposed to say that. Um, but on behalf of the family, want to wish you well. I would have guessed and, uh, that anyway. I'm sorry? I would have figured that out anyway. Oh, you would have figured that out anyway. So, okay. Anyways, happy birthday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It, it's technically a Shabbat Hanukkah, but uh, we wouldn't be able to mark it with a class. So this is certainly a, an honorable substitute. Okay. Okay. Now we can get starting on, on Tanakh. Tanakh is okay. many, many years older. <laughs> okay. So... Uh, first of all, just to uh, summarize and to bring us up to date. So what we've learned so far is that uh, 24 works of early Jewish literature um, eventually came to be known as Kitve Kodesh. We just lost your sound, by the way. We, oh, we just heard you say Kitve Kodesh, 24 books became Kitve Kodesh, and then we lost your sound. Okay. Uh, the 24 books became known as uh, Kitve Kodesh, as Holy Scripture, uh, consisting of the five books of the Torah, Breshit, Shemot, Vayikra, Bimidbar, and Devarim, eight books of Nevi'im, divided into four that are uh, called Nevi'im Rishonim, and they are more or less historical, there are the books of Yehoshua, Shofetim, Shemuel, and Melachim, and the four uh, books that are known as Nevi'im Acharonim that are more in the line of what we regard as classical prophecy. Those are the books of Yeshayahu, Yirmiyahu, Yechezkeel, and the anthology of 12 smaller books called Treasar. And then finally, there are 11 books of Kituvim, scriptures, which are also subdivided. There are first three books that are called Ketuvim Gedolim, and that's on account of their relatively greater size. Uh, Tehillim, which is the largest book in all of the Tanakh, Mishle and Dio, followed by five books that are called collectively as the scrolls, the Megillot, and they appear in our printed Tanachim in the order in which they are read in the synagogue throughout the year, beginning with Shir Hashirim on Pesach, and then Rut on Shavuot, Echa during the summer on Tisha B'Av, Kohelet on Sukkot, and finally Esther uh, at uh, the close of the year. And they are followed by the last three books of Tanakh, Daniel, the combined books of Ezra Nehemiah, and finally Divrei Hayamim. And that clearly by the first century of the Common Era, or at least by the time that the Mishnah was itself canonized, at the very beginning of the third century of the Common Era, these 24 books and none others were regarded as Kitve Kodesh, the Holy Scriptures, and were therefore considered to be metamimeta yadayim, that people took great care, exercised great care in handling them because of their special status, and that anything outside of these 24 canonical books if indeed it had ever been a contestant in the canonical sweepstakes, was ordered for, to geniza, that is to be concealed. Okay, so we've covered the subjects of authorship of the biblical books, and we covered the subject of canonization, how those books written by those particular authors came to be collectively known as the Bible, the Holy Scripture. This evening, we start on the third facet or dimension of, uh, of the organization or evolution of Tanakh, and that is the uh, development or the emergence of what is known as the Masoretic text. The word Masoretic is really just an Anglicism.
pronunciation of a Hebrew word, masoret or masora. You see at the bottom of the screen, the dictionary definitions of the verb mem samach resh, to deliver up, to deliver up, to offer, to hand over. And the one appearance in Tanakh of the noun masoret, which would mean something that was delivered, something that was offered up, something that was handed over, okay? Uh, and it appears once in the book of Yechezkeel as part of a uh, combination of two words, masoret habrit, that is to say the transmission or the tradition of the covenant, okay? And the word has come to designate the Hebrew text of the Bible because the Jewish scholars, particularly, though not exclusively, during the um, ninth and 10th centuries, who uh, labored to see that text through to its completion, were called Baalei Masoret or Baalei Masora or if you wanted to use, a, to, to use a combined form, they were called masranim. That is to say, those who delivered over or handed over right, or transmitted the correct text of the Bible. And it is therefore in the honor of these Baalei Masora that the, even in English, the text that they refined and that they essentially oversaw its completion is called after them, the Masoretic text. And there are three principal uh, dimensions that we're going to discuss over the coming weeks that pertain to the Masoretic text. And that is the consonantal text, the vowels that accompany the consonants and the punctuation marks that accompany a vocalized text in certain manuscripts of the Bible and in just about every printed edition of the Bible. And we'll see that uh, the way in which the Bible appears in our printed editions today can be uh, distinguished from the original 24 books of Tanakh in these different dimensions the consonants, that is to say, the shapes of the letters that we use in Hebrew today is not identical with the shapes of the letters that we used in Hebrew originally. The vowel signs that tell us how to pronounce those consonants, um, the, the um, values, the phonetic values that they represent, a, ah, e, o, u, probably came along with the text as it was recited orally when it was first written and when it was first articulated. But the symbols that are used in our printed Tanachim to represent those phonetic values, a kametz, a patach, a sego, etc., those originate only in the Middle Ages. And finally, a well-edited text of Tanakh, not all printed texts of Tanakh, but a well-edited text of Tanakh will consist not only of the consonantal text and the accompanying vowels, but will also have a form of punctuation marks. These punctuation marks are not the kind that we would anticipate based upon whatever we learned in ninth grade freshman composition. They're not periods and commas and colons and semicolons, et cetera, but rather they are a different series of symbols that serve the same function as periods and commas and colons and semicolons, but they have come to be known traditionally as ta'ame ha-mikra, biblical accentuation marks, because they serve a double function. One of the functions that they serve, as I've already described, is the function of punctuation. They tell us where a sentence ends. They tell us where is the greatest pause within a sentence. They tell us which words are to be connected to each other 
and which words are to be separated from one another. But over the passage of time, these same uh, symbols have come to take on musical values. So that when people read biblical texts for liturgical purposes, like a Torah reading in shul on Shabbat morning or Shabbat afternoon, or on Monday or Thursday mornings, or on Rosh Chodesh, or throughout the holiday of Hanukkah, whether the text that's being written read aloud in the synagogue is a Torah text, or whether it's an accompanying text from Nevi'im that's serving as a Haftarah, or whether it's a text of one of the Megillot that's being read to mark a particularly celebratory or solemn occasion, okay? those same marks that initially were developed to serve as punctuation marks also have served the purpose of cantillation marks, or as they say, musical values. And that is why we call it, we call Kriyata Torah a cantillation, because it's not a, 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 a um, solemn reading, uh, as you would, for example, have um, on the radio. Uh, in Israel, I, I'm pretty sure it's the same today as it's been for the last, you know, 70-odd uh, uh, years, uh, uh, although I imagine that nowadays the radio stations are on 24, probably seven, unfortunately, although some of them surely only 24, six. But back in the days when Israeli radio was not on 24 hours a day, when, when transmission began in the morning, the first thing that you would hear from the radio would be a version of Matovo or Halacha Yaakov, the opening verse of the Sidur, and it would be followed by something that was called Pesuko Shel Yom, a biblical verse that was chosen for that day. Those verses were usually read by professional announcers, and they were read very solemnly, you know, Hayom, uh, Bayom, Hazer, whatever, something along those lines, right? It wasn't sung as the text is, is basically sung in the synagogue today. So these are the three things that we will be looking at, consonants, vowels, and punctuation. This evening, we, if we're lucky, we're gonna make our way through the consonants. And here we go. So I'll start off with the observation that a comparison between a contemporary printed text of Tanakh and the identical work of literature as it passed from beneath the hand of its author would be distinct in four areas, meaning there are four basic areas of contrast between the original biblical books and the way that they appear today. The first pertains to writing materials and the, and the physical form that the book took. The second pertains to the alphabet, and I've already given away part of that, namely that the Hebrew alphabet in use today, in fact, the Hebrew alphabet that's been in use for the last 2000 years and more is not at least according to archeological evidence, the original Hebrew alphabet. So that if we can assume that biblical authors used an earlier form of the Hebrew alphabet, then that is a marked difference between the text that they wrote and the form that they appear in today. Similarly, divisions within the text, as I said, it's only our use of what we call the Tameha Mikra's punctuation marks that enable us to determine where a biblical verse ends. In a text of the Torah, and therefore assumedly in the original, all of the original 24 books of the Bible, there are no divisions within the text. There are no periods, right, to mark the end of a sentence. There isn't even spacing to mark a division between sentences. So this too is a, is a visible uh, distinction, contrast between an original biblical text and its contemporary equivalent. And finally, again, as I've already illustrated, the use of vowel signs, vocalization, 
and accentuation or punctuation of the text. So first of all, let's say something about writing. We assume the original books of the Bible were written on. And there is a reasonably wide variety of writing materials that were available to authors in the biblical period. From the fact that our Sefer Torah, our Torah scroll, has traditionally been written on parchment, we may conjecture that even the original, not only Torah, but maybe all of the original biblical books were similarly written on parchment. Right? Parchment being the processed hide of a kosher animal. Uh, nowadays, almost invariably a cow, but there are uh, there is certainly evidence not widespread, but ample evidence that the hides of other kosher animals were used uh, over the course of the last 2000 years for Torah scrolls. Uh, uh, I um, uh, once saw a scroll that was dated to the ninth century, not BCE, of course, ninth century of the present of the common era uh, that was written on a deer skin. Okay. So, uh, in addition to parchment, which again, as I said, but it's still conjecture, is the likeliest material on which the original biblical books were written. The, the skin uh, choice would be papyrus. Um, papyrus refers to uh, pages that were woven inside the Nile River to remember. Your sound is very choppy and I'm sorry. He's in waiting. Uh, so they'll run. Um, uh, the papyrus was processed in Egypt. Uh, but it was then um, okay, everybody. I assume um, the good doctor can can you hear us? We can't hear you. Okay. The company blinks, it mutes itself. I'm back. Okay, with apologies. I don't know what. Okay, we, uh, we lost about a minute, a minute and a half. That's it. It wasn't okay. too bad. Yeah, that, that we didn't see, that you didn't show yet. You were discussing, you started on, on papyrus. papyrus. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, so, maybe we can start there. Basically, basically, it's all here, right? Um, uh, papyrus, as I said, is manufactured um, from uh, reeds that were culled alongside the Nile River. Uh, they were processed into uh, sheets of papyrus. You can see a description of it here. I'm not going to take up the time just to, to read it. Um, uh, on one of my several visits to Egypt, I actually spent a morning in the Papyrus Institute, uh, in which they reproduce papyrus sheets today. Uh, using what they maintain are the uh, historical, the original, authentic methods for the production of papyrus. Um, the result is something that is not entirely smooth, but it's smooth enough that it can absorb the ink from a quill pen, and it doesn't. The ink doesn't run um, enough to make the text illegible. But the most interesting thing that I want to note about papyrus, I was saying just before we were so rudely interrupted, uh, that the papyrus was manufactured in Egypt, but it was distributed throughout the ancient world from a city in Phoenicia. The city in Phoenicia from which the papyrus was distributed throughout the Aegean and throughout the Middle East came to be known in the Roman period as Byblos, B-Y-B-L-O-S. It's 
original name was Geval, but it came to be known as Biblos, and that is the origin of the word Bible. The, the collection, the book in which the uh, 24 sacred works of Jewish literature were compiled came to be known as the Bible primarily because it was written originally upon papyrus leaves that were associated with the city of Biblos. So if you, uh, uh, so the etymology of Bible connects to the use of papyrus. Here, just to give you an idea, is an example of a papyrus. This is a 13th century BCE Egyptian papyrus, right? You can see the hieroglyphics on it. Uh, and I chose this papyrus in particular, Papyrus Ipuer, it's called, named after the scribe who wrote it, because um, it contains descriptions of things that match some of the 10 plagues that are described in the Torah. So this is a text that if you are studying uh, Sefer Shemot, you're studying the era of the Exodus from Egypt, you might come across a reference to it. Another, uh, another um, uh, material that was used uh, in the biblical period for writing, but you could hardly write a whole book on it, were called astraka. Astraka are inscribed pottery shards. Okay? You know that in those days, they would make not just little pots, but they would make large things, Greek amphora, for example, this is to say large urns in which they would store grain or in which they would store wine. And if they broke, right, um, this was, I guess, a, an early form of, uh, of recycling. They would take the broken pieces of this piece of pottery and they would use it. They would use it in order to write short messages. So here you have an example of an astrakhan that comes from the city of Samaria, Shomron, in the eighth century BCE, which is to say during the time that the city came under siege by the Assyrians and shortly before it was conquered and destroyed. You see the notation on the bottom, right? That this is, that this is the ancient Hebrew alphabet. We'll talk about that in a little more detail in, in just a few minutes, but this is, indeed a Hebrew inscription on an astrakhan, that's the singular, astraka is the plural, and again, these are um, uh, shards of pottery. Another example of an astrakhan from the Judean city of Lachish from the sixth century BCE, and this is during the time that it came under siege by the Babylonians, and shortly before Lachish was conquered and destroyed by the Babylonians. Don't ask me why I picked two ostraca from periods of destruction, but it just happens to be that these are the best known um, samples or examples uh, of their type. A another uh, type of writing material was stone, served for monumental inscriptions. So it was uh, um, important enough that it was intended to last forever. Um, it may not be forever, but you can see that this uh, stone inscription uh, has lasted at least since the ninth century BCE. Right? That means pretty much close to 3,000 years. Okay? I think nowadays it's probably in the British Museum. Um, it, it's named after Mesha, who was a king of Moab, who fought against Ahav, the king of Israel, and whose story is told at the beginning of the second book of Kings. So it's a fascinating example, not just of a stone inscription, but a stone inscription that bears upon a biblical text. And finally, not so much in the land of Israel itself, but in Mesopotamia during a contemporary period in time, um, not only short messages, but large works of literature were written on, um, on clay tablets. 
uh, the heading here says cuneiform tablets because cuneiform is the script that is being used in these inscriptions. Um, the tablets themselves uh, are, are, are baked clay. The clay would be partially baked and then it would be removed from the oven while it was still damp. And then these um, cuneiform, the word itself means wedge shaped. These wedge shaped characters would be inscribed on the damp clay tablet with a stylus, an iron stylus. And then the tablets would be replaced in the oven and baked until they were dry. And then they could be stored, right? And provided that you didn't drop them and they didn't break, right? They would last for a very long time. And indeed, uh, they uh, some of these tablets, again, largely in the British Museum. Uh, some of them uh, are even, uh, as I said, uh, 3,000 years old or more. Um, if you want to know what the 42.81 um, is under the heading cuneiform tablets, that's how much it would cost you to get these cuneiform tablets, which are uh, just facsimiles. Okay, so that a biblical book, as it emerged from beneath the hands of its original author, when compared to that biblical book, as it appears in our standard printed editions today, would differ in the material on which they were written, and also in the shape, the form that the book took. When we say a book, we're already jumping ahead in history because the earliest works of literature, not only Jewish literature, but the earliest works of literature that we know of, the uh, Sumerian and later the, Mesop the later Mesopotamian epics of creation and the flood, even though they are lengthy works of literature, were written on clay tablets, not on, on one, two, or a dozen really big clay tablets, but a large work of literature would be written on scores or even hundreds of clay tablets, okay? But again, as I said, we have really no evidence for the use of clay tablets uh, for, uh, for um, uh, early works of Jewish literature. And therefore, again, we're assuming that the earliest works of Jewish literature, the works of books of Tanakh were written either on parchment or on papyrus. The, the, the form that the earliest works of Tanakh took were most likely the form of a scroll, a Megillah. And again, we're just assuming that, uh, that our Sefer Torah, which hasn't changed at least in the 2000 years that we have um, documentary evidence referring to it, we can assume that this is the form that they took originally. Even though throughout the Tanakh, it's called the Sefer Torah. And if you look up the word Sefer in a modern Hebrew diction, it'll define the word Sefer as a book. Strictly speaking, that's a misnomer because the word book signifying individual pieces of, let's call them either paper or papyrus or parchment, okay? Individual pages that are bound together on one side, okay? That's not the way the, we assume that the original books of Tanakh were written. And as I said, again, our evidence is that's simply not the way in which the Torah was written. The Torah was written on individual pieces of parchment, but those individual pieces of parchment were not placed one on top of the other and bound together on the side. Rather, those individual pieces of parchment were attached to each other, forming a scroll. And the Hebrew word for a scroll is a migilah, from the verbal root gimel lamid lamid, which means to roll. So a migilah 
literally is a role, okay? So you see here again, just going back to what a knowledge we have of scribal practices in the biblical period, a conventional roll or scroll uh, generally consisted of 20 individual sheets that were attached to each other. They could either be glued to one another or as in the case of a Torah scroll, they could be sewn together. However, an individual scribe possessed the ability to determine the length of a particular scroll, either by shortening it or by extending it. And bearing that in mind, at least the evidence that we have today, the longest scroll that we know of was an ancient Egyptian papyrus that measures actually 131 feet, okay? However, in the Hellenistic period, when there was a greater tendency to standardize these things, um, a standard roll or scroll generally did not exceed, you know, 36 feet, meaning about 11 meters, okay? Now, one of the disadvantages of a scroll is that in a scroll, you write on only one side of each leaf. Okay, whereas in a book, you can write on both sides of each leaf. Therefore, it didn't take long, as you see, till about the first century of the common era, for people to figure out that books were much um, cheaper to produce than scrolls because you could write on both sides of each leaf. Therefore, eventually, the scroll was replaced by the book. Um, the word book didn't exist yet. When they first took these individual leaves that were written on two sides and bound them together, right? it was called a codex, a codex. And eventually the papyrus scroll was replaced by the parchment codex because first of all, parchment was stronger and more flexible than papyrus. Papyrus deteriorated over time more so than parchment. And again, despite its heavy use, the disadvantages of the roll were too many compared to the parchment. Parchment was easier to copy on than papyrus. Parchment didn't have visible fibers running through it as the parchment did, as the papyrus did. And generally, that simply explains why, by, as I said, during the first century of the Common Era and thereafter, is when we see the transition, the wholesale transition from papyrus to parchment, and similarly from scrolls to codices. Here you just see an example on the left-hand side of a rolled up scroll, an ancient Egyptian scroll. And if you look on the right-hand side, you see something very interesting. It's very unlike our Torah scrolls. Our Torah scrolls unroll, or I guess they roll too, they roll and unroll horizontally. The earliest scrolls in Greek and even in Latin rolled and unrolled vertically. So here, for example, just in, in, one, uh, in one poignant drawing, we see on the bottom, just imagine that this is that these are the same texts, right? On the bottom, you see the text represented in a scroll, okay? where the leaves, individual leaves are attached to each other, glued or sewn together, and then rolled up and then unrolled to be read. And above it, you have, again, arguably the same text in the form of a codex or what we call a book where the individual leaves are all bound together on one side, enabling you to write on both sides of each leaf. Um, here's just a, a, a surmise 
we started uh, our uh, adventure in the canonization of Tanakh by looking at a passage in the Talmud that spoke about Sidran shel Nevi'im and Sidran shel Ketuvim, the order or the sequence of the books of Tanakh. Once you use the term seder, order or sequence, there's some sort of an implication that you want to know where things are relative to each other. Scrolls generally are placed one alongside the other. Books are generally placed one on top of the other. Therefore, it's a reasonable assumption, as you see here in the last lines of the text, that the question of the order or sequence of biblical books that we saw in the Talmud, in Masechet Bava Batra, is related to this period of time, the first or second centuries of the common era, to the transition from scrolls, which were usually laid out side by side, to codices, the forerunners of books, which could be piled up. Once you were going to consider putting one book on top of another, the question naturally arose, which one goes first? Biblical, different biblical texts, particularly the book of Yirmiyahu, um, give us certain insights into scribal practices in the biblical period. And that's because Yirmiyahu tells us that he had a professional scribe or sofer who worked with him. And basically the scribe tells us that Yirmiyahu would recite a text to him aloud and he would copy it down. He said, Va'ani kotev al hasefer badyo. So we get the idea that biblical texts were originally oral. And then at some point, the authors or someone later than the author would then recite the text out loud while a professional scribe wrote it down. Now we come to the question of the alphabet and orthography. Um, if you ever needed or your children ever needed their teeth to be straightened, you know that ortho means straight because you probably took them to an orthodontist, right? And if you ever had to deal with a fracture or a severe sprain or a break, right, of a bone, then you know you went to an orthopedist. So you know that the prefix ortho means straight or correct, right? And the substantive graphos in Greek um, means writing. Okay, so orthography means the correct or proper way to write. So um, I, I've also already mentioned a couple of times this evening that uh, archeological evidence indicates that the Hebrew alphabet that we use today, which is reasonably the same as the Hebrew alphabet that was in use throughout the second temple period, meaning from the sixth century BCE onwards, is not, the Hebrew alphabet that was in use throughout the first temple period and presumably earlier. So what we have here is a chart that doesn't show us the early Hebrew alphabet, but it shows us an alphabet that was very similar to the early Hebrew alphabet, and that is the alphabet of the Phoenicians. I'm sure you all remember from elementary school that the Phoenicians invented the alphabet. Okay, um, so, so whether indeed the Phoenicians invented the alphabet or whether the Jews invented the alphabet doesn't matter because even if the Jews invented the alphabet, they used the Phoenician alpha, they used Phoenician characters in order to uh, in order to write that alphabet. So what you have here is an interesting chart that uh, that matches. Letters in the, it's called early Phoenician, but as I said, just assume for a moment, and you may assume correctly, that these are the essential shapes of the Hebrew, letters of the Hebrew alphabet, okay? And you can see that they are alongside the letters of the Greek alphabet. And it's not hard to go from the Greek alphabet to the contemporary English alphabet, even though, as we know, they didn't go directly, but it first passed through Latin. So A is still the first letter of the alphabet. B is still the second letter of the alphabet. You get to the third letter of the alphabet, there's a bit of a difference, right? Our third letter is not a G, but a C, okay? 
but our fourth letter is still a D, okay? And you can see that the E, the epsilon of the Greek alphabet, right, is basically the mirror image of the, of the fifth letter in the Phoenician alphabet. Now, let's go back and let's reacquaint ourselves with the Phoenician alphabet, or as I said, with the early Hebrew alphabet. The first letter, the one that in Greek is called alpha, is called aleph. The one which in Greek is called beta is called bet. The one which in Greek is called gamma is gimel. The Greek delta is dalet, okay? When we come to the, the fifth letter, bit of a difference, right? In Greek, it's an epsilon, and in Hebrew, we call it a he. But despite the, the difference in the name of that letter, you can see that visually, graphically, it's, it's the mirror image. And you can see that the delta is the same. It's only a question of just you know, tilting it on its side. Okay? The gamma is essentially the same as the gimel. The bet and the, and the beta are certainly similar. And again, the, uh, the aleph just seems to be an alpha that's standing on its side. Let me take you now very quickly through a fascinating um, series of speculations on the, on the Hebrew alphabet. Um, uh, this is um, uh, uh, not my own. It's a courtesy of a professor at Barilan University who is one of the uh, leading uh, experts on ancient Hebrew paleography, meaning the, the use of, 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 uh, of writing and, and sim written symbols if in, uh, in ancient, in, in biblical times. And he speculates that the letters of the Aleph Bet are arranged in a certain way, perhaps um, to make it easier to learn or easier to teach. So that he takes the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet and divides them into five categories. The first category, he says, consists of the first six letters of the Aleph Bet, which he says all have to do with the homestead. So here you see, first of all, these are the characters. I just took them off that previous chart. And here is his, is his description. What is the letter Aleph? The letter Aleph is an ox head. If I were to take this, let me see if I can do it. Um, if I, okay. If I go here and turn this on its side, let me see if I can turn it on its side. Here we go, ah, okay, okay. Um, does it look more like an ox head now? Here are the two horns, right? Here is the face, here are the two horns, okay? The word ilpa in Aramaic means an ox. So the argument is that the first several letters of the Hebrew alphabet all refer to things that you could find around the house. Now, obviously not talking about a house as we have today because who keeps an ox in the house? But we're talking about a, you know, a, a household or as he calls it a homestead in the biblical period. Bet of course is the bayit, is the house itself. Gimel is another animal that you were likely to find on the homestead, namely a camel, a gamal. Dalit was the doorway to the house, to the bayit, okay? Hey, he says, is a human form with raised hands. And the letter Vav is a hook, which could serve as a hinge or as a bolt for the Dalit of your bet, right? For the doorway, for the door of your house, okay? The next uh, group uh, of um, of letters, he says, refers to things that you find out in the field. And here they are, Zion, Chet, and Tet, okay? Zion may be from Zayat, an olive. Chet, sounding like Chita, wheat, okay? Tet, from Tit, which is um, uh, 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 clay or mud, uh, represent, which is 
what, what roads were made of in those days. And therefore it's represented here by the sign of a crossroad. The next group of three letters all come from body parts, right? The yod is the arm, right? The hand, okay? Kaf is the palm, right? And lamid is the extension of the arm in the form of a malmad habakar, of an ox goad, or if you wish, a shepherd's crook, okay? But conceivably, right? Uh, 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 ideally, the notion of the extension of an arm. The fourth group, Mem, Nun, and Samach, right, all come from the world of water. Mem, Mayim, you can see it's represented here by something, a, 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 a pictorial representation of flowing water, okay. Nun, perhaps from the word Nachash, meaning a serpent, and Samach, which in Aramaic means a fish. Now, I know this doesn't look like a fish, but it certainly looks like fish bones. And finally, the last group all come from parts of the upper part of the torso and the head. Ayin, an eye. Pe, the mouth. Tzadi, the forehead or the temple. Kuf, the skull. Resh, the total head. Shin, for a tooth, and ultimately tav, which a mark that was placed on the forehead for a variety of reasons. And he gives one classic example, a citation from the book of Yechezkel. So here, if we take a look, and this is really the last slide for this evening, we can see the left-hand column is essentially the Hebrew alphabet with which we are acquainted, and as I said, is essentially the Hebrew alphabet that has been in use since the Second Temple period. We will, in coming weeks, uh, say more about just what caused this transition from the earlier Hebrew alphabet to the current Hebrew alphabet, but right now, just simply the facts. The first column is the current Hebrew alphabet, okay? The um, uh, further column on the right-hand side is the ancient Hebrew alphabet. And in between, you can see different pictorial representations or part of the Greek early or late Greek alphabets. But right now, as I said, I just simply want to uh, focus again uh, on the Hebrew alphabet. So again, what we have is Aleph, right? The ox head. Bet, the Bayit, Gimel, the Gamal, Dalit, the doorway, right? Hey, arguably the uh, human figure, the Vav, the hook or the bolt, Zion representing perhaps the olives, Chet, the Chita, the wheat, Tet, the um, uh, pavement, okay? Uh, uh, Yod, the hand, Kaf, the palm, Lamid, the extension of the arm in the form of a shepherd's crook or, or ox goad. Mem, the flowing water, Mayim. Nun, the serpent, the Nachash. Samach, the fish. Ayin, perfectly clear, that round circle. Pe, the mouth. Kof, the, I'm sorry, there's Tzadi missing here. Oh, look at that. You realize that, so you put it on the bottom. Okay, Tzadi, perhaps the forehead or the temple. Kof, the uh, skull, Resh, the toe to the entire head, the head, um, Shin, the teeth, and finally, Tav, the mark on the forehead. When we uh, resume next week, we will, uh, look, um, we will uh, look at some passages in the Talmud and in early Midrashic literature that attempt to um, account for the uh, switch from the Hebrew, from the ancient Hebrew alphabet to the current Hebrew alphabet. And we will talk about the uh, vowel signs, where did they originate, 
the Tamea Mikra, the punctuation marks, where did they originate? And again, we'll look at some uh, classic uh, medieval texts that, uh, that um, uh, inform us as to which of the different Masoretic traditions, which of the different traditions uh, preserving the consonantal text, the uh, vowel signs that tell us how to pronounce them, and the punctuation marks that tell us how to articulate them. Um, they were not always universally agreed upon. There were occasionally differences of opinion, sometimes significant, sometimes relatively insignificant. And those are the uh, those additional features we will look at in coming weeks. So let me have a quick look now at the chat. And okay, why is my and did vowel marks appear before the printing press? Yes. Vowel marks appeared well before the printing press. There were variants. I said, we'll talk about that next week. Absolutely. Um, is the word oh, Hamasora, an Isaiah, a, pro a prophetic illusion? No, 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 no. It's, it, um, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in, in Yeshiva College, maybe I should even say Yeshiva University. I mean, why should I discriminate against, uh, against Stern College? In Yeshiva University, the word Masora uh, is a very big inside word. Um, it, it, it's supposed to represent the tradition, okay? But if you think about it, the word Masora represents tradition only from one perspective, from the perspective of an older generation, which is Moser, handing over its tradition to the younger generation. From the perspective of the younger generation, what should it be called? Kabbalah, right? Because the word lekabel is to receive. Just as limsor is to transmit, lekabel is to receive. So in essence, masora and Kabbalah are the obverse sides of the same coin. The coin itself being, in this case, the received text of the 24 canonical books of the Bible. Do we know of any individuals involved in this, which enterprise? Yes, we, um, we don't know any of the names of individuals involved in the transition from ancient Hebrew to what we call current Hebrew. We don't know the names of individuals involved in the transition from parchment, from papyrus to parchment, or from scrolls to, uh, to codices. But we do know the names of individuals who, uh, who took upon themselves, as I said, in the Middle Ages, who took upon themselves the responsibility for seeing to the preservation of the correct consonantal text vocalization and punctuation. And we will again uh, learn more about them uh, next week. Um, and the differences are not so much between Ashkenazim and Sepharadim. There are differences amongst Ashkenazim and differences amongst Sepharadim. Relationship of trop to Gregorian chant. We haven't said anything. I haven't even used the word trop yet. So just we'll, we'll get to that point. Okay, um, I don't know source links the same. That's not a question to me. I don't know what that is. I dealt with it. Nice paper of famous prints, uh, relative of papyrus. I, I, I'm not surprised. I am not surprised. I, I, I would find, uh, uh, first of all, I, I'm gluten intolerant personally. So rice is a tremendous staple of my diet. And I, I, I have a very close working relationship with rice as I have a very close working relationship with text. And I've never really thought of rice and text as being related to each other. So yes, indeed. Okay. Uh, is there anything else here? Um, yes, I said codices were whatever, the, 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 they had tremendous advantages over it. Uh, orthodoxy. Yeah, okay, right. Another example of ortho meaning straight or proper. Okay, there we go. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We'll see you, please, God, next week. Enjoy the rest of Hanukkah and enjoy the 
you know, you know, birthday cake. I don't know exactly what kind of cake you have, but uh, I hope you'll enjoy it. And, it's uh, uh, it, it's uh, gluten free. Gluten free birthday cake. Okay, very nice. Okay, tomorrow uh, Shuli Mishkin wraps up her series that uh, on uh, medieval Israel, and uh, tomorrow night eight. That's at twelve noon Eastern time, and then at eight thirty p.m. Leia Silver will be giving our um, weekly Parshat Hashavuah here, Parshat Mikach, you know, great stuff, Yosef, of course, and um, and Friday morning, 9 a.m. Remember last week we changed the time, 9 a.m., my, my Shira on the sitter. Uh, we'll be continuing with the Hanukkah, Al Anisim, and um, et cetera. Okay, uh, everybody have a wonderful night, and uh, invite your friends, and uh, we look forward to learning with you soon and seeing you soon. All the best, everybody. Laila Tov and Hanukkah Sameach. Thank you. And happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, this is a good week to have a birthday in, you know, because the only biblical birthday was Pharaoh's. Ah, there you go. They say that the first Jew to celebrate his birthday after Pharaoh was Leopold Sunz, whose 100th birthday was celebrated. Otherwise, in between, there are no records of Jewish birthday celebrations. Zunz lived to be a hundred? I did not know that. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. Very interesting. Yeah. All right. So no birthday. You don't want to be the uh, the the baker at Paro's birthday, like like party. That's all. He probably made him a gluten cake. <laughs> <laughs> finished it off. Finished it off. That was it. The butler is one thing, but you don't want to be the baker. Okay. Anyways. Okay. But you know that. The Chafetz Chaim made a big birthday party when he turned 90. You know that story, right? Uh -huh. I, I, yeah, that's I, I don't know if it's true, of course, but they say the Chafetz Chaim made a big birthday party when he turned 90. Chafetz Chaim lived to be 95, 98, 102, different versions. But I lived, uh, so they asked him why. The only Parah made birthday parties. It's not a Jewish thing. So he said, you know, his whole life, he told people not to talk in Lashon Hara. Mi Eish HaChafetz Chaim, Moav Yamim Liratov. So he wanted to live a long life and Sorla So he wanted to show that it was true. So when he turned 90, he made it for that's the story I heard in high school. I don't know if it's true. And then they said, no, no. Then they said uh, he when his hearing was going, he refused to get in the hearing aid. So they asked him, why is he getting a hearing aid? He said, if you want to talk, you're gonna to have to yell, and no one's gonna yell lush and horror into my ear. So that was a uh, no no. Again, I don't know if these stories are true, but uh Lubavitch, for whatever reason, they're big into birthdays. No, I think if anybody can tell me. That's what I said. Lubavitch was big into birthdays. But uh, anyways, all right. Um, everybody should be well. Enjoy your birthdays. Uh, Thank celebrate. You. Thank have you. Good occasions. Okay, be well. Good night.